You are listening to the I Love Mayoko podcast, Souls in Transit. For years, we've been sharing the vibrant lifestyle of Mayapur through our videos. Now listen to inspiring stories of devotees from around the world. Why do they live as they do? Hear how they overcome challenges and how they practice bhakti in their lives. I was talking about that European traditions and I did it according to these traditions. So okay. the vow is usually only walking. You're not allowed to go in a car or bicycle or anything and without any money but also receiving money. You can't receive money. If people give you money, you don't take it. And I was stuck again in Armenia for some time. I was really, really sick. I almost, I almost died. And then I entered Iran. Don't you know. run too fast. <laughs> I almost, I almost converted to Islam, to be honest. Okay. My only expectation, that, that was a clear expectation, is that I get the answer that I was looking for. You know, like, is there God? God is... You know, it's, it's something that you can't really express with words. It's not really about, is there something? It's more like, should I keep looking for you or is it not worth it, basically? Give me like a clear sign and I'm gonna put as much energy as possible to make myself available to hear this answer. Is this audacity? Yes. Oh wow, that's so much memories for me. <laughs> so many memories. I've, I've spent like days and nights on that thing, recording my first albums, you know. Audacity. Recording your albums? So you, you're you yeah. like, you're a musician? Yeah, uh, the, that's basically what I was doing, yeah. Okay, I think, I think it's a, that's not the only podcast we will have in free life. Ooh. There's too many things to tell. That's interesting. <laughs> So, Hare Krishna, welcome, my dear ladies and gentlemen, to our second podcast. Today we are four, because we have a special guest. We have Rida Chaitanya here with us. He is um, from France, devotee from France. And of course, we have Vinu Prabhu, Pradyumna and myself. But the topic of the day will be um, pilgrimage. Rida Chaitanya made a very special adventure. He made a journey from Italy to India by foot. So I think this is the topic we want to cover. And before we write, jump into this and into Rida Chaitanya's amazing personality, I would like to ask you to begin with what kind of a person you were when you started this journey, how it came about that you wanted to go on such a adventure yeah, what? on such a journey yeah what what made you do yeah. what, what 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 happened that you make these decisions okay i want to i want to walk now <laughs> from europe to india i think it's not a one day thing it's a long process that slowly slowly leads you to that but it's it's something i've been postponing for um like almost 10 years Like when I was 12 or 13, I was already dreaming of doing, doing this, but I was more aiming towards Jerusalem because my conceptions were a bit different at that time. But, you know, when you keep, um, you know, procrastination. So I think the worst kind of procrastination is the spiritual one. <laughs> yeah. But like the most important things for you, you keep postponing it because you think you have other things to do. So it's been a long, it's been a long process. Like, can I have a normal life? Uh, can I stay in France? Can I like? There's so many questions, and I was looking for the answers. So I was traveling a lot. I left home when I was um, 17, so I went to Cambodia and different places, trying to live in different places, but nothing really satisfied me. So till the point I realized that what I needed to do is leave everything, but specifically internally. It's not really about leaving your home or living, but it's about leaving a, the very conception that you have of yourself and of your life. And somehow I was on a farm with my brother-in-law and things weren't going so good for me. So, you know, the moment came where, you know, when you're 20, I don't know, I was probably 23, 24, you're going towards the, like you, you're becoming a grown-up, <laughs> hopefully. And my, my life was kind of um, appearing in front of myself, like the future, being with my wife, having a job, all this. And I couldn't do it. Like, it just felt it wasn't for me. So it took that shape, uh, going to India, walking. I had some contacts with the Gaudiya devotees before in France. Okay. So. Okay, well, what, like, in what context, what, what kind of contact you had with, with 
I was the, the first it's time time. I was hitchhiking in Switzerland and I ended up in a festival in the mountains called Bhakti Bhakti Festival or something. Mm-hmm. Ah, they have a Bhakti retreat every every year. Actually, mm, Prem no. Prayojan Prabhu was speaking there. It was in the Shiva Ita. Ah, Prem Prayojan Prabhu. Yeah, but the place was completely amazing. Like there's. I know that the devotee was running the this ashram. I think I just forgot his name. All right. Anyways. And I ended up there, and Prem Prayojan Prabhu was reading the Bhagavad Gita, and I was amazed because I was very interested in Sanskrit at that time. So I was studying, but from a secular point of view. And when I saw that Bhagavad Gita was much more than just Sanskrit, right? And so yeah, and and then in the city where I next next to which I was working, there's uh, Udhav Prabhu. I don't know if you know him. He's running a little ashram there, and it's very beautiful in the hills. So I was going there from time to time. Just I was familiar with kirtans and different aspects, but I wasn't really committed. Um, so to answer your question, I think I was um, I was a happy guy still, but very lost because nothing satisfied me, whatever I did. And I was into farming and music mostly. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I have already 100 questions. <laughs> Start with one. <laughs> I mean... Uh, First of all, I'm I'm very curious that uh, you said that you already had some inclination when you were little, like even 12 or 13, that, yeah, I mean, you, you literally said that you were procrastinating for a solid 10 years, uh, you know. So what, what makes a 12, 13 year old, do you come from a very deeply religious background? Is your family very religious or were you deeply interested in religion or spirituality? Or, or, or because a normal, regular 12 or 13 year old doesn't usually think about such topics, I, I guess. Um, so, yeah, my family is very, very religious uh, and spiritual, <laughs> both, I would say. Um, so, yeah, I got, I got like a strong, a st- strong religious education. Um, you know, every evening, prayer all together. So it wasn't just about rituals, but it was really something that we were accustomed to inside. So, um, yeah, definitely some a lot of spiritual samskar. <laughs> and um, what made me think this when I was 12? That's a good question. I wasn't... I was Because you said you wanted to go to Jerusalem? Was yeah, I mean, it was the trip? same, kind of the same thing, you know. You, I wasn't really satisfied with anything. Like, I was, I was bored. I was really bored, you know. But then usual like, 12-year-olds, they're like... Looking for some games or yeah, some other true. stuff or some. When I was twelve, I wasn't that happy. Looking, you were looking yeah. for for spiritual sites, for spiritual places. This is yeah, at least what I thought was spiritual at that time. Yeah, I was looking for this for sure. I mean, you know, all my friends thought that I was kind of a bit, a little bit obsessed with this for sure. Like whatever I did, even when I was more like into drugs and stuff, there was a spiritual motivation behind. Whatever weird it may sound, but actually, mm. you know, yeah, actually, many people experienced it that way. <laughs> well, I, f- I think many uh-huh. of, of us and many of our viewers probably have a similar experience. So yeah, all, all good. So, so yeah, what made me think? I mean, it's you know, I heard something recently that the mind twists, like twists a lot memories. It's actually very difficult to be accurate when you speak about your mood. Fifteen years ago, we yeah. usually transform things. But as far as I can remember, I wasn't that happy when I was 12, for sure. And everything that society had to offer was was boring in advance for me. I wasn't really interested in, in uh, studying in girls or um, maybe like drugs was something that I was I was enjoying. But al- always with this mood of like finding what's beyond the veil, you know, and I didn't really know what I was talking about. But yeah, um, I was already pretty obsessed with that, I would say. Was, was there something else that inspired you actually to go on this path, to, to walk, actually? Like, I mean, there's this, you know... Yeah, in, in Europe, we have a very, very strong pilgrimage tradition, you know, like walking. They used, they used to put a bag of ashes on their head. You know, I, I really, I was in love with all these traditions. You know, mm-hmm. you just leave everything behind and you, you become a homeless, but like internally as well, you know, and you just put a bag of ashes on your head and you beg... And you walk, and you never know if you're gonna get there alive. You know, they used to do this to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is more of a symbol. You know, actually, my family name means 
the pilgrims who go to Roma walking. Mm-hmm. So you know, this, uh, there's a, I have many different. I've, I've read book about it as well. Your, 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 your family name, your surname, is translated as pri- pilgrims. Yeah, Ru- Rumia means those who walk to Roma as pilgrims. You know. So anyway, this is just like yeah. funny. So you're from a pilgrimage no, family. This, this is very interesting because yes. in, you know, in our in our philosophy, we already we always talk about sukriti and past lives and the impressions that we carry uh, and spiritual. Any any spiritual practice uh, leaves its impression, and is you carry on f- in the next life from where you kind of left off in in your previous life. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, I mean, for me, this is another example of, uh, of 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 our philosophy actually in practice. You know, you this is very evident. I mean, I guess in a way something happened. Not that you're asking. I, I, my mother came in Mayapur last summer, and she told me about this. She reminded me. I, I forgot. But I woke up, I, 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 I used to woke up uh, the same month every year from my 12 to my 15 something. One morning, I, I don't remember the month, but I would wake up, go straight to my mom and say, I have to walk to Jerusalem. Mm. And it was kind of like, you know, I was, I was kind of a sleepwalker. I wasn't really awake and I was really asleep. I know it sounds a bit weird, but I, I clearly remember when my mother told me last July, I remembered how it happened. I, I had this half dream, half reality, and I knew that in one sense my life wouldn't start unless I do this. You know, and it's always been a feeling like whatever I did, it doesn't really start. Nothing starts. It's just like I'm postponing. And I did a lot of cool stuff. You know, you know, I, I wasn't bored at home at all. And I, I was, I'm, 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 hi- I'm, how do you say, hyperactive, mm-hmm. constantly doing stuff. So it's, it's not like I was laying in a sofa and being right. bored, but still, nothing really started. I felt and. Somehow inside, yeah, I've always knew that unless I do this kind of surrender attempt, mm. then nothing would really start. And by the way, when I got to Mayapur, I felt like my life is finally starting. Mm. <laughs> Literally, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. So, okay, how, so... Y- how, uh, how old you were when you started? When you when, when started? So, the <coughs> 2018, now it's... 24. 24. So 24. Six years ago. Six years ago. So I was 23. Ten, 23. Yeah, I was 23. You're still young. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You had, you had. I mean, now I, I know you're now married, have two kids. But uh, those time you already were in a relationship, or with yeah, you? yeah. I met my my current wife. I met her when she was 14. So we're together oh, for okay, like mm. long time. for more than 12 years actually. Yeah. Okay. So, Okay, what's okay, you 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 <laughs> next? You I next. want to I want to know. I, I would like now to jump. To, okay, now you started your journey, and then what what changed, or then what were your first steps? What did your wife say, mm. former? So you just say goodbye. And, and you're, I also, your also your parents, also your parents, maybe you know, like <laughs> your mom. You, how does she felt about you? Were so it wasn't a big surprise for my parents at all. They were expecting it, kind of. But did you prepare, like, okay, I will go in, like, in six months, or was it, like, yeah. more like a... I told them a year in advance. Okay. But somehow they didn't process the information <laughs> at all, like, not at all. <laughs> and um, the day before my departure, it was my sister's wedding. Uh-huh. So everyone was partying, and the next morning when you had a bit of wine and everything, you're a bit, you know, you can't process emotions, you know, the next, if, especially if you don't sleep, you know. So my father, yeah, like the next morning when he realized that I was I was going, I, I saw him crying for the first time, mm. the first time in my life, but like crying like a baby, you know, because wow. everything makes in his mind. Like, you know, he wasn't really, he didn't trust me in terms of finding my way at all. <laughs> I'm the kind of guy who can get lost <laughs> in my own house, you know, and I, I didn't like phone at that time. So I never had phone before. So I was going just with a paper map. And the very way it was presented sounded a bit weird, like I'm going to India walking, you know, and I didn't, I didn't really know where and how and through which road or anything. So my father freaked out a little bit. My mother is a strong woman, really strong. So she gave us a lot of love, but also a lot of detachment. So she just hugged me. She cried a little bit and she said, like, you know, get out of here with a big smile, you know. Did did you prepare yourself like no like like in advance like where's the route where do you go which places you want to visit or no not really really not like you know my brother is a um, officer in the foreign legend so he's been trained to like survive in the jungle and everything so 
two hours before I left, we took the map and he showed me how to use a compass. <laughs> 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 okay, you know, uh, like literally two hours before, okay. and yeah, I mean, I knew, I knew that I wanted to start from Genova, Italy, because somehow I calculated that the the snow would block the road in Georgia, which is much much further. So yeah, I I, I did a bit That's of preparation, okay. and specifically the visa, okay. like what visa do I need and how I'm going to deal with this without yes, money yes, and yes. all that. But otherwise, the specific roads, no, definitely not. Okay. You, you, you mentioned money. I guess many, and I'm very interested. Did you had money or you took money? Or you had like no, because I, I, so I, I was talking about that European traditions, and I did it according to these traditions. So okay. the vow is usually only walking. You're not allowed to go in a car or bicycle or anything. And without any money, but also receiving money, you can't receive money. If people give you money, you don't take it. You know, that, that was part of my vow, basically. Okay, all with more or less all with invitation in the end, or yeah, I mean you know in Italy I was in the right season, so I would grab fruits all along the way. It was pretty comfortable, and then you have leftovers in the restaurants at the end of the day. You can always go and ask, otherwise you beg, you know. And I want to say like as soon as soon as you get to Muslim countries, you don't have to beg. <laughs> That's for sure. Okay, okay. What 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 do you mean by that? Muslim people will feed you. Yeah, yeah. That's hundred percent sure. Like. It's so deeply rooted in their culture. Even if they have nothing, they will see a, like someone walking on the road. They will invite you and, f and feed you for sure. So from Turkey to Iran, I d didn't really have problem, except in the desert where there's no people. <laughs> so people might be generous, but if there's no people, you can't you can't eat. <laughs> okay, so literally you went with no money, with no credit card, with no safety, something something in your pocket more or less. Of course, I mean, you maybe had this, the, the security, okay, if really something happens, I would can, I could call my parents or something that's in, in case something Yeah, will. I mean, I had like those old phones. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's important to understand the principle behind it. It can yeah. take different shapes. You know, it's not really about, um, it's not really about doing something crazy. It's more about what shape, like you want to, let's say you want to surrender, for example, to something bigger than you. What form does it take? You know, it doesn't matter if you go without money or if you, it doesn't even matter if you walk, actually. The principle of the pilgrimage is um, you have to leave everything behind and you have to open your ear. You have to listen to what there is to listen, <laughs> what there is to hear, right? Mm. So you need silence and you need complete poverty. You need, mm. you need to be poor because otherwise you still... And, and I guess maybe it's on the, the faith and the trust, okay? You know, God, the high principle, will yeah. take care of me. He will. And it's not a faith that you have before you go. It's yeah. something you're hoping to build by doing it. I yes, had yes. no faith. I still have no faith, by the way. <laughs> but when I left, I had uh. absolutely no faith. But you're hoping that by being destitute, in one sense, you will build that faith because you will be faced with so many situations that you will have to trust something else than yourself, right? Or technology or whatever. So that was the intention, right? So yeah, like practically speaking, I left without anything, like a, a tarp, a small tent, and and a sleeping bag. That's pretty much all. And most of what I brought extra was stolen in Italy after after two months, you know. So <laughs> I carried on with like literally nothing. Okay. And I took it as a way to deepen a little bit more my my approach, okay. like you know. So maybe we pull back a little bit to start in the, in the journey. So we started in Italy. So I started in Genova. Uh, with, with my wife, because the first um, thousand kilometers or something was uh, was we started on a Christian path, you know Francisco de Assisi, mm -hmm. right? So there's a pilgrimage that goes through the mountains, and you can walk those paths. So my wife, being Christian, we did that pilgrimage together to start with, for a month, and um, so mostly on little path in the mountains. And one funny thing is that. We crossed the, the Genova Bridge with the bus to start, like to go to the place where we wanted to start from. And two hours after that, the whole bridge collapsed and like 300 or 400 people died in this, you know. And we, you know, in terms of timeline, it was really like we go through and then, you know, it collapses like the, I think, yeah, a few hours after that. You know, so something. Which bridge is the bridge called? It's like Gen January. Yeah, you can check it Genova. out. It was, it was Genova Bridge. Genova, yeah, Genova something Genova Bridge. collapsed at that time, and yeah, 
big, big Schnapp accident. Gewann. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. You, you knew you when you like, you heard it when you like when you when you arrived. I heard, heard it much it? later, but I I realized that the the dates kind of you know they match. Anyway, so yeah, we started and. Um, so the, the the way back was really like. <laughs> <laughs> don't go, don't look back. <laughs> yeah, back. yeah, kind of. You know, the symbol. That's how I experienced. Of course, it's, it's not really funny because people die. But my name, my personal, you know. Anyway, um, so yeah, we started from Genova. We went straight into the mountains. The vow was the 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 no money thing. Vow was very interesting in the beginning because I, I didn't really speak Italian. <laughs> So I had to learn day by day, and it, Italian people can be tough as well, you know. And we went through an area that was devastated by a um, hurricane a few years before, so everything was destroyed, and people were already very poor. So it's always a bit embarrassing to go and beg where people are poor. So, you know, that's the main part of the experience, is that I could do otherwise. I've chosen to do that. I'm not actually in need in the sense that I could stay home and just live my life. Will people understand? That was my main question. And it turns out that, yeah, not only people understand, but they actually, they value you for this. They, they, they give value to this because it's like a real exchange, you know. They give you something, but your, your presence, you don't do anything, but your presence getting also gives them something. So that was, I started to understand how the dynamic will run for the rest of the pilgrimage. And it, I mean, it was an amazing experience. Experience. I was um, chanting on the way. My wife was chanting as well. So you were already like chanting Hare Krishna at this time. Yeah, thing? in my own way, but yeah, like okay. super slow. <laughs> Sixteen rounds would probably take me two days, but yeah. You had you had time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, how did you do with like sleeping? Like how was? We had a small tent. Okay. Yeah, my wife is tough as well. Like she's really tough, so <laughs> she didn't really mind. And she, and she doesn't eat a lot, so we were happy with little pieces of bread here and there. And I mean, it was amazing. Like I don't even know how to describe it. You know, yeah. we would drink in the in the waterfalls and just you know. Just to get a little bit of an idea, like you know, where did you walk and how long time it took? So you went from Italy to. So it took a month to reach uh, Assisi, mm -hmm. more or less a month. Then we stayed there for a few days. Then we said goodbye to each other. <clears throat> that was probably the most emotional time of my life for some reason because we really didn't know if we would see each other again and my wife was going back to her life and work and everything and I, I was going to this kind of crazy project right so that was that was very interesting for me as well like crying like a baby for three days you know like like a little boy really like all my how to say all my protections kind of completely collapsed mm. you know And then I reached um, the east coast of Italy. We call it Adriatica. And it's a long way to the south. Um, very dodgy road, like really not really nice. And I got, so all my stuff got stolen. And the next morning... With, with tent also? No, I got, I got my tent left and my documents. That okay. was a miracle, you know. And I found some of my cloth further like a few hundred meters further just thrown away you know mm. so i took it back but i was i was literally naked when i got out of my sleeping bag on the beach you know they took everything they could they could <laughs> take you know so that was like um interesting and a few days before there's this indian priest that rescued me and that was interesting as well because he was uh, converted to christianity so he was really upset with me going to india And it was kind of a first contact with an Indian person, but trying to discourage me from going, right? Like these people are crazy, they're worshiping cows and, you know, trying to explain to me how bad India was wow. and everything. So, so you really like tested, like... Yeah, like, okay, you know, it really told me like this... separation from your wife, the, the things get stolen, you... Yeah, the first... The person speaks to you, don't do this. Yeah, the first three weeks were, were tough. Like, were, you really get tested, huh? I mean, do it was pretty tough. Shopping. And... Uh, Yeah, even, you know, if you want to talk about being tested, there, there was every 20 meters a prostitute. You know, and not that I'm being tempted at all, because I was, you know, in my thing, but it was super weird in terms of atmosphere. You know, this, like, 16 years old from Eastern Europe coming to you, and, like, every, honestly, every 100 meters on the Adriatica. It's super dodgy there. Mm -hmm. So the atmosphere wasn't really conducive for, you know, so, yeah, the first three weeks were a bit heavy, 
And then I reached the south of Italy, and for so many reasons that I'm maybe not going to explain here because it's about the map and the roads and the time and everything, but I've decided to take a boat to Greece directly, which is also a very interesting project because how do you take a boat without money, right? So I had to work with the refugees in the fields, and then the priest gave me a ticket. It was a whole thing again. Okay. You know, this... Honestly, I can't tell at all because there's so many experiences, people that I've met on the way and my first experiences with all the refugees, living with the refugees all along the coast, you know, sharing my food with them. So many mm, refugees from where? From, from Africa? So, uh... so this coast was mostly Pakistanis. And um, so they basically get the status of refugees, but they're not oh, they're, technically okay. refugees. I think it was the time when I think many came to Europe also, 2018, I think, maybe it started. Well, yeah, exactly. That's what they're doing. And then f people from Nigeria, a lot. Congo, and then all those French-speaking French, French -speaking African countries, a lot of people from there. And so for me, it was like going on the other side of the mirror in one sense. So know? because all, all of them, because there was many, many people went to Europe, actually. So you met them on the way, you went to the other exactly, direction. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> they went to the other direction, they went all to Europe. It was part of the interesting dynamic is that everyone would tell me like, Oh, we dreamed to go to your place. And I was like, well, I'm going east. <laughs> I'm dreaming to go the other way around. So there was a lot of interesting conversations with those people, especially with the Pakistanis people. Very interesting conversations. And then, so this priest gave me a ticket and I entered Greece. It was not the Indian priest, it was a different priest. Yeah, he was Italian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, then you went to Greece. And from Greece, I guess you had to take another boat to... No. Greece was full land till the end. After that, I went, I, w I crossed Greece like that. I went north. I stayed there for a while because of the winter, because the roads were stuck by snow, the roads that I wanted to, to go through. So I was stuck in Greece for almost five months, actually. Five months? Yeah. So I had to find a place to stay as well. You know, it was a whole... And you managed the whole time, like, without money, like... You yeah, if, I mean, exchange. how can you do when you literally don't have the money, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could start. You could start, like, working. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, no. So um, this was still, like, your... I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a rigid person. <coughs> like... But with five months, it means it sounds a little bit, you settled down a little bit on, on, on some place, yeah, like, in one place? Or yeah, like yeah. In... So f I, the first place I ended up in was a, a farm, a sheep farm, um completely um, like all the workers are from the Pakistani mafia basically there's a huge mafia all along the river from Turkey to Greece so I mean that's a whole story in itself but I arrived by night and they thought that I was Pakistani so they dumped me in the sheep house with the Pakistanis and you know we would sleep on the floor it was minus eight minus eight degrees like really cold no hot water almost no food like we would Uh, roti like all day you know and 14 hours of work per day and I refused the salary because it was was my vow right but that, it was amazing I mean you know I now have like a family in Pakistan literally these people are <laughs> when they realized that I wasn't working for money they really became really close to me and we had amazing exchanges also very interesting because as a French person we get this flows of refugees or people coming from Pakistan and It, it divides a lot, politically speaking, you know? And I got to be treated like a, like a Pakistani by the Greek farmers. So it was so interesting for me because I was on the other side. And I could speak very frankly with the Pakistani guys, like 18 years old, 20 years old coming to France. And I could tell them face to face, like, I, I like you so much, but you shouldn't come, really, you know? So it was such, a, such an experience for me as well. And I got to learn Greek. I was studying Greek a lot, so... And then after some time, more than a month, I ended up in a in a uh, like a hostel on the beach with there's no one there, and I stayed there for four months, and that was one of the best experiences of my life, like living just with dogs and firewood, and I would you know you had the snow on the beach and the sea and the Olympus mountain behind me, so it was like stunning landscape, and complete silence, like no human being around. It was. For me, it was a deeply meditative and an amazing experience, really. Okay. Not lonely? You, you were completely alone there? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For three months? 
for four months almost, yeah, yeah. Maeva and my wife, she joined me for here and there for a few days every uh -huh. time. You know, she three, would fly three times, I think, yeah. Okay. She would come. <laughs> so we got stuck <laughs> under the snow there, and it, you know. So, but no, I'm I'm very happy with loneliness. Like, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask, what what yeah. what does it give to you to be in this secluded meditative place? Well, you know, all the energy you people. spend, rightfully of course, but you spend it interacting with others and processing so many informations. All this energy, when you're completely lonely, it's available. So the question is. If you have nothing to do with it, usually you get restless and you get very, you can even have like anxiety. That's why people are anxious when they're lonely because you don't know what to do with this energy. But if you have a strong objective, a strong goal, then you have much more energy to, to use for that goal, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. maybe right now, tomorrow, if you put me in the desert, I would need a few days to adapt because I'm processing so many information on a daily basis here. But loneliness in itself is a good thing if you want mm. to achieve something internally, I think, really. Silence especially. We tend to forget this, the Hare Krishna movement sometimes. You know? Yeah, they had their bhajan kutirs with no yeah. windows and no doors. That it's like We tend to value, you know, Sankirtan is like the main thing. Yeah. But we tend to forget sometimes that silence is so conducive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I mean, our emphasis is very much on, on association, actually. It's, it's, a very, exactly. it's very highlighted with yeah. us, you know. If, Good association, we have to have association. Sure. But it, it's a very good point that actually we, we forgot we forgot to be alone. We don't know how this actually feels and what's what's you know what's the value of you know we can't handle loneliness anymore. That's a good point actually. That we so, yeah, loneliness is very powerful, really powerful. To, to be very honest, to have to say I'm you know I can't even remember when I was. I mean, yeah, what do we, what do you do then when you yeah? What do you do? <laughs> you know what do you. And I can't, I can't say because I never had this experience actually to be in like a, for a longer period without people. I mean, it's, I think it's an experience not many have actually. Okay, interesting. So, may I, may I a little bit more dig because you said before um, that you then find this dynamics very interesting. You, you when you when uh, people saw okay, you cannot. Uh, they they have to give you food without the yeah. exchange of money, but they still valued your being very much. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? What do you mean? Like, what what, what, what was the thing they valued? I think it's all about projections. Like, you be, you, when you're the pilgrim, you're the figure of the pilgrim, you become the, the medium for their projections. There's nothing to do with who you really are. Like, it's not like they find me amazing or anything, not at all. It's really about... They will project so many things on you and you become the thing that they want to do, but they don't dare to do, you know. So they don't even really listen to your story, actually. Like most people don't listen to you. And that was fine because I wasn't here to be listened. I was here to listen. So I heard so many things. I didn't really want to talk at that time. I was more about opening my ear, you know. So I, they would tell their stories. I would listen sometimes for hours. And then they would assume my story because my story had to be their story. If you get my point, like there's my story was the story that they want, but they can't do it. So they would project on me and they would like, sometimes it was very embarrassing, really embarrassing. Because mm -hmm. again, in my pilgrimage tradition idea, you have to be the humble, the humble one. You know, you have to be the one who begs. But they sometimes put you so much in the center where you don't want to be there. Because again, it's about projections mostly. So I guess you introduce yourself and actually what you what you're doing, what you are, and I mean you have to make it clear for whatever. Yeah, people. with in as some less ways, details as possible. In some ways, I understand. I mean, I get the point that people when they see and hear your story, you know, and and I mean if they are caught up in their life and maybe they even had in their use their similar like thoughts. Okay, I would like to. Yeah, or any kind of dream or any kind of yeah, dream. Yeah, whatever you like dream you have in in your life, and then you have someone in front of you who is, you know. <laughs> doing like you know so much you know give up everything and make such a journey then of course it, it feels like okay what i'm doing actually with my life you know what what i'm you know and I'm, I'm losing my dreams i i never went after my and then people you know like you said sometimes you know then they start talking about you know or maybe you know maybe making excuses or whatever you know, and, you know but i understood it differently i understood it like 
it's like an inspiration or it's possible to <coughs> I think to I guess you find different kinds of people all kinds of, of people mix of both yeah. 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 yeah it's definitely a mix of both but yeah it's just important to remind that it's about projections like for example they think it's so hard to leave everything behind and go so they think you're so brave but they don't understand that if I did it it's because that's what I want to do it's easy for me to do because that's what I like you know you see my point like I wasn't really attached spontaneously to comfort or anything, so it wasn't hard for me. There's been some, like, a little bit of courage required for some steps, you know, but they take their state of mind and they project it on you, so they think it's, it was as hard for you as it would be for them to do it, which is not accurate, obviously, because we're all different. So I had to, to deal with all these projections, and my main way of dealing with it was, you know, in, 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 it, in Italy, you, you easily say, I will pray for you. And you say goodbye. I will pray for you. And I realized something at one point is, is it true? <laughs> you know, because it's just a formula. Like, you just say it like this. But, because part of my vow was no lying. Which is really hard. Because th there's lying and there's subtle lying, right? There's all the things you do and you don't really do it. So it's not like you're lying right in their face. But you're saying things that you don't really... Or you're not going to follow up on it. You don't carry out the implications of it, right? Mm. So one day I decided that I will write down all their names, which is a lot of names because many people, you know, give you a piece of bread and something. And then every day I will read this list of names and kind of whatever your conception of prayer is, you know, pray for these people. And this, it kind of balanced this um, uncomfortable projections that I was facing because I felt like I was kind of trying to give something back, which obviously is very, you're giving on a subtle level, <laughs> you know. I've read, that, I've read that book where the pilgrim says, people give me bread and I'm trying to give light in return. And obviously the light doesn't come from you. You okay. try to get it from somewhere and you're trying to like be the medium for something. Most of the time it doesn't work because you're, you know, I'm, I'm who I am. Like light doesn't go through me. <laughs> But, you know, sometimes you, when you see the, the person like crying and then the next morning be like, I'm going to change this in my life and this, you're like, what happened? You know, I didn't say anything. But again, it's about projections, you know. And the, this prayer thing was very, very important for me. Like reading those names. I still have the list, you know, some on a piece of paper in my place. And Did you did you have like a journey or did you have like a, a diary? Yeah, I had a little notebook. I didn't really write anything, but mostly the names of the people. And I would read that list for a year and a half almost, you know, till Iran, till the very last day of the pilgrimage. I would read all the list from from the beginning, you know. So you prayed? Yeah, and it's also a way to meditate on what happened and make. to meditate on how dependent you are on people. Like, mm, I couldn't do even 1% of what I did without the people. It's also a very important realization because sometimes people say like, oh, you know, you're so brave that you left your work and everything. And I was like, you're working for me. <laughs> you know, like, I can't survive alone. Not at all. You guys are working... You guys are working, so you have the money to buy food, so you can give me bread. So I'm I'm fully dependent on you. You know I'm not bringing any value to the society. I'm you know, and it's also a burden in the beginning. You know, yeah, you're literally not bringing any practical value to anyone. So you have to find that value somewhere else, right? <laughs> and the fact that people were working hard, they had a home when it was cold. They would give me a bed sometimes. Who pays for that bed? Their work. You know. You can't really say God paid for that bed. In one sense, yes, but in on the, on the other hand, these people are working in their life. So that was the whole, you know, it, it was a long discovery for me because beginning I had this romantic idea of the pilgrim, but then you realize that in the desert without any people, you don't you don't make it. You know, <laughs> you just don't make it. You don't arrive to Vrindavan. <laughs> so people have to be in society to allow the pilgrims. You know. I'm not sure if you mentioned this um, before you started the journey. Your goal was to go to Vrindavan. Yes, it was Vrindavan. Because we are mentioned India, I think, but you yeah. already had yeah. like Vrindavan in your mind. Because like, Vrindavan was more of a concept for me, you know. What concept? What was the concept you had? Can you remember? Honestly speaking, this blue boy with a flute, <laughs> you know, like was was just amazing for me, and I had as as less preconception as possible that was part of my approach of pilgrimage so during the pilgrimage I was like 
basically made a bet with God, like, you know, if you exist, you have to prove it to me in this pilgrimage, otherwise I'd never want to hear about you again. And then if you don't exist, then no problem as well, you know, I'll just do my pilgrimage and then carry on with my life. So Vrindavan, for me, embodied this kind of, whatever has to happen, it will happen in Vrindavan, you know. So but I didn't have a clear idea. So honestly. you had you had some like general doubts about like you know God spirituality does it exist or not or was it like was it also one of the points you want to you oh, want yeah, to I mean, discover fully like I, I wouldn't even call it doubts like you know I have a very particular relationship with doubts like I, we're not going to talk about this now but like doubts for me is it's just like I was fully aware that I I didn't know it's just. As simple as this, we don't know. Mm. You know, we have experiences and we build our lives on these experiences, but we yeah. don't. We can't yeah. say that we know. And I really needed something to know. You know, okay. I was. So this was part of the journey that you actually want yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like, how am I supposed to express this desire that I have for God or whatever you call it? Um, that that was the stake of the pilgrimage for sure. You know, and it's it's kind of tricky to go in depth, but so many things yeah, happened that gave I mean, answers to this. You know. But yeah, Vrindavan was the goal, and um, I had no further projects in Vrindavan for sure. I didn't know what I was, what I will do there, or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I had no contact. But we will, we will, we will get there. So traveling further from Greece, yeah, Greece now. Yeah. So Greece. I left Greece in spring. I went straight to Turkey with so many things on the way as well. Then I entered Turkey, and then I walked all the, all along the north coast, the Black Sea coast of Turkey for three months to reach Georgia. And then from Georgia, I went south to Armenia. Then I was stuck again in Armenia for some time. I was really, really sick. I almost, I almost died. And then I entered Iran. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, no, 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 don't run too fast. <laughs> 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 I mean, just, just briefly, you know, maybe you don't have to go in detail, but I mean, for example, Turkey, I mean, Turkey is, it's a huge country. I mean, it's, it's pretty long. Yeah. So how long time you spent in, in three months to cross the whole to, to cross? Really? Yeah. I mean, you know, when you, you were, were walking, like you were not stopping much, you no, were no. really going no. straight. And uh, as I assume or I heard like, you know, Turkish people are very welcoming, very yeah. friendly and uh, yeah. for guests. Turkish and, people saying Turkish people is a, a little bit like saying Indian people. It doesn't really yeah. mean anything because you have so, so many, many different, different people there. Okay. The Black Sea coast is very particular. But yeah, yeah, people are amazing. I mean, um, you can't really express it. You know, it's like, yeah. it's so many personal personal experiences with people. But generally speaking, they're very generous, very spiritual, most of them. Um, kind of upset with Islam as well, but the cer a certain Islam, you know, they're very spiritual, still in Islam, but they're more going towards like, you know, Movlana, the Sufi part of Islam, mm -hmm. you know. So it was, I almost, I almost converted to Islam, to be honest, like, okay. you know, it was so many. I mean, this is, I can, you know, like you go, you not only go to, to you go to countries, you go to religions, you go yeah. to different mentalities. And, yeah. and also part of my, my, um, and it, uh, part of, yeah, sorry. So you, I mean, I can, I can imagine you had many conversations also with different people and I guess yeah. also religious and philosophical talks. Specifically in Turkey. Yeah. Because from Turkey, people get, they're more comfortable with spirituality, you know. Italy and Greece is still very Western mentalities and they're not really interested in this it's anymore. It's just Catholic or Jesus. Yeah, but not even like, actually, yeah. normal people, they don't care. And then you go to Orthodox priests and they, they can be very fanatic, like, really. I'm not, I'm not saying bad about Orthodox in general, but you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, general people I think are not very I, interested in speaking I, I, about. I think in, in every religion you will find, you know, sure. both, in every, both sides, you know, you always The have difference is that in Turkey, normal people will gladly speak about God, mm -hmm. even to disagree, but they have, they're interested in the conversation in mm -hmm. itself, which is not the case in. Yeah, you it's know. a bigger part of their lives, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Sufi people are amazing, <laughs> literally amazing, you know. They can have like 12 kids. And just dance all night and <laughs> sing all night, to pray all night, you know, and then go to school. You know, I've seen that like three or four times, you know. And um, a lot of loneliness in Turkey as well, which was was wonderful for me, because you have the mountains above the sea, so it's just like stunning. <laughs> and shepherds and like I don't know, it's just the language was amazing. It's one of the language that I got 
really attached to. Um, you learned a little yeah. bit of Turkish, or like? Yeah, it's it's kind of part of my obsession, I would say, <laughs> like spirituality and languages at that time specifically. So I was, like, when I was not walking, I was I was studying the language, you know. Oh, you really like had a book with you and like studying language. I had like a very small book to start with. I I kind of came up with my own method. I still have it now. Like I created my own method to learn language to see like to see how fast I could do it also because I didn't have much time in the country to to figure it out. So I came up with my own uh, uh, method, and um, and it worked decently well. I mean enough for me to to speak. Yeah. So I'm. Um, I just try to remember the map. Okay. Uh, so yeah, Georgia then, then goes goes into north of Georgia, and then all the way to the south of Georgia, and then you enter Armenia. I got stuck there, um, and that was the first like a uh, healthy, humbling experience for me. Like really humbling because I felt really, really sick, and I was stuck for almost two months. And I've lost like 12 kilos in two weeks, you know, so I was like... I mean, I can imagine you were like skinny like anything when you start with. Yeah, right? I was like, <laughs> at that time, you know, I was like like a skeleton, really. And it got worse and worse and worse What and worse. What kind of sickness like, did you have? Yeah. I was losing my minerals, you know, like, but like, and <laughs> long story short, but in Cambodia, I, had, I, had, I got cholera as well, like years before. So I knew how dangerous it could be. I had problem with my heart and stuff. So I know how dangerous it can get. And but I was so um, rigid with my vow that I didn't want to get help from anything, and I didn't want, of course, to go back to Europe to be healed or anything. But at one point, it just didn't work. Like I was, you know. So my wife came and she started buying medicine for me. This didn't work either. And every time I would try to walk again, and after three days, I couldn't even open my bag. Like my hands had no energy at all. And I would fall, and you know, it was like, just didn't work. You know, I was about to, I don't know. And so eventually, I was, uh, I flew back to France. Uh -huh. okay. You know, which was like, dev like I was devastated. You know, because my okay. vow was everything for me. So this was a way to break my vow, basically. Okay. I was put in the hospital. They found what I had. They gave me the right medicine. And when I had three or four kilos back, I immediately flew back to Armenia, <laughs> to enter <laughs> Iran. You know. Just so I think I was in France for two weeks, or three two weeks, weeks only. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so, but um, your wife dragged you out, or you, you? Yeah, you I mean, my wife and my parents all together kind of like started saying like, you can't, you know, you can't carry on like this. So for me, it was I was I, I was uh, humiliated. Like my ego got a really, you know, it was very nice as a in, in the pilgrimage dynamic, you know. But I realized that later. That it was actually part of the you know the process. And this, but then this was all this almost like how many months? Seven. That eight, was in um, that was a year after my August. departure. Of one year already. One yeah. year later. Yeah, yeah, because that was in August, and then I entered Iran from Armenia, and that was my last country because uh, I had three months visa possible in Iran, and it took me three months to cross the desert. <laughs> So when I arrived in the south coast, kind of like uh, eastern side of the south coast, a little bit after, uh, no, it was Bandar Abbas, so like south. I was planning to go through Baluchistan, straight to Pakistan, because I had so many contacts in Pakistan. And uh, the Iranian authorities, they didn't allow me. Like they, they even wrote me an email, like personal email saying, you have to go, you call, you know. And Pakistani authority as well refused my entry. So even okay. if I would, so the, let's say, hitchhike to Pakistan, they wouldn't let me in, you know, for different reasons, um, different reasons. I've, I've spoken with, like, some high authorities in their office, actually, mm -hmm. and they, they laugh. They say, you know, you're funny, we like you, but... But you told them you know. you were, your plan is to go to, to India? Or? Yeah, I was very straightforward. I was like, you know, I'm walking, I have these rules, these vow, and... Uh, Otherwise, if you lie, you can be in trouble because in Baluchistan, you have to walk with an escort, like, uh, how do you say, escort soldiers, like, you know, mm -hmm. protecting you. And you need a long visa because Pakistan is, there's mountains, there's like a lot of preparation to cross these areas. So I couldn't lie about it. It didn't make sense. Yeah. And I wasn't, many people told me you should have a hitchhike or take a bus or something, but I wasn't really interested in doing this because my vow was my vow. Like, if my vow is over, I just go to in India straight. I wasn't really interested in traveling around. It wasn't really my mood. So taking a bus through Pakistan or through Turkmenistan and all these things, 
I wasn't really interested. If I said, well, you know, if I'm done, like I, there's absolutely no way. I've been studying the map for a year, every single day studying the map. How can I go? How can I go around and all that? There was no way I could do it. So my vow was over. So like, just you know, they they say go to Tehran and take a flight to wherever you want, but just get out in in okay. the next two weeks. You know. Okay. After, so you made it until Tehran, <laughs> Tehran, Iran, Iran. Until what? Sorry. You made it until uh, Iran. This is. Yeah, basically, Bandar Abbas. My wife did the last 10 days with me, and we have that picture on the harbor of Bandar Abbas, just like, you know, we're like, we're done. <laughs> and she flew with you then? and then. Yeah, from? and then we spent a few days in Iran because we had a few days remaining on the visa. We had a lot of adventures there because there was a like national riot, so, so many people got killed around us, and like, because so many things happened. But then we, yeah, then we flew to Delhi. We flew from Delhi. Yeah. Okay. And from Delhi to Vrindavan. To Vrindavan straight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What? 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 Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> no, not so fast. Uh, and I mean, this. Uh, I, I, I'm not so so good in the history and everything, but there were. I mean, there were some conflicts in this area, like war and, and stuff. So. Well, not in Iran, like not not in proper Iran. conflict. But what happened is the American uh, did this um, sanctions against Iran at that time, so the price of petrol went like. So high that people got really pissed with that, and uh, the Iranian authorities' way to deal with this is usually to just go with a machine gun and just you know, like literally shoot the crowd. <laughs> so yeah, all internet was down in the country, so we didn't know where to go. We were in the desert, so it was kind of tricky. So, where was like this the the most scariest part for you? Or was like where you felt like I mean besides like you know maybe being sick being sick mm, yeah that was a, that was scary because that sounded very I was scared of not fulfilling my vow that's, that's the biggest fear you can have just, you know? just another question just when we're on this topic um, when you came back to France I mean I could imagine that your family your wife even said okay you're good you know you, you did it you know, don't go back they, they try to convince you to stay or not something? at all none of them like none of them They knew you that you. Really you know they know me so well. Like they knew if I would, I would just be in depression forever in France if I don't fulfill it. You know, like finish my. What? My wife actually pushed me, you know, and my parents didn't really want to talk to me even because they didn't want to influence me. So I know my mother was kind of crying, you know, sometimes, but she was like very respectful and they just said I mean, like. I can imagine they were like scared like anything. I mean, they saw you then in the hospital or. Yeah, yeah, they saw me and everything. I can imagine that when they saw you, like, losing so much, you know, you, you, how you looked and skinny. Well, I don't want to make them sound, like, insensitive or anything, but my mother's, she's really tough, you know, like, her brothers all went around the world and stuff, so she was like, you know, get healed and do whatever you want. And my father, my father is more like, he trusts hospitals in general, I would say, <laughs> at that time. So if I was in a hospital in France, I was safe, you know. Okay. And I didn't tell much at that time about my journey and what was happening there. I was very just to the point, like, I'm sick. Apparently, I can't do it anymore, so let's do that. And then I'm leaving as soon as possible. I didn't really tell them all the surroundings and all, like, where I came from and all these things. And they didn't ask. That was very respectful. You went with some kind of expectation on this on this journey. And how, did you see that this was fulfilled or not fulfilled or different fulfilled than you thought? Um, that's, a good, that's a good question. Well, I tried as much as possible to have very few expectations. Of course, it's impossible, but it was my intention. My only expectation, that, that was a clear expectation, is that I get the answer that I was looking for, you know. Like, is there God? God is... is you know, it's, it's something that you can't really express with words. It's not really about, is there something? It's more like, I, I don't really know how to put that. But it's, yeah, it has to do with, with like, is there any, uh, is it relevant or not to trying to have a relationship with that thing, for example, let's say, you know, um, you know, in spiritual life, you can move like three steps forward and two steps backward and it always goes like this. So <laughs> for my pilgrimage, I came back to very simple questions, you know, before that, I was in many different, you know. Uh, ways to put it but for my pilgrimage it was pretty simple it was like should I keep looking for you or is it not worth it basically give me like a clear sign and I'm gonna put as much energy as possible to make myself available to hear this answer 
That was my mood, basically. Hmm. Like, I walk, you work, because <laughs> I can't do it. I realized I can't do anything. That was my state of mind when I left. Like, I can't find the truth. I can't even behave properly with myself and with people. I can't, you know, so let's just, like, you know, I just walk and you do the rest. So my expectations were, were yeah, clearly, like, I need to get a, a final answer about this. But the final answer is more about, should I start my spiritual journey? It's not like I was expecting to reach perfection or anything. I was mm. more expecting to reach a point where I can decide whether or not I want to start a real spiritual journey. Someone would say, like, of course, my spiritual journey started way before because I was already searching so much. But, you know, in terms of commitment, like, you really yeah. give your life to something, you know. Mm. So... For example, he took the form of like, should I become a monk or not? That was really a question for me at that time, for my wife as well. You know, so we were both in this question for so many years. So, um, was it fulfilled in one sense, way above my expectations, way above that? Mm -hmm. Especially uh, in Iran, like what happened to me in the desert. That was like for me, I think it's it's the foundation of my life now and probably for the rest of this life, is what happened to me in the desert. May you share and some? It's kind of difficult, but I would say, like, to put it simply, like, probably you're going from the realm of thoughts to the realm of experience, but, like, kind of what I would call mystical experience, the mm -hmm. real experience, the thing that you can't deny it, you know. So it, it, it it's forever, you know, you can't deny it. And it, yeah, basically. And it's very, I don't really know what to say what else to say about this but it's um it's, it's also very personal yeah, <laughs> of course. like really personal but it completely changed my life that's for sure and for the better and um that was above my expectations way mm -hmm. above mm -hmm. yeah and then in terms of my pilgrimage uh no i was very surprised and very like a lot of uh, unexpected things happened first of all the fact that i couldn't technically fulfill my vow, you know, I couldn't reach India walking. For me, that was a huge uh, defeat, you know, mm. when I, I, I always say, like, I arrived in Vrindavan as a loser, you know, and later on, when I discovered a bit more about the tradition, I realized that you can only arrive in Vrindavan as a loser. If you <laughs> arrive in Vrindavan as a winner, you can't see Vrindavan. <laughs> mm. So my whole honeymoon with the Gaudiya Vaishnavism <coughs> has been possible because I arrived in Vrindavan as a loser. So I was, I was defeated, you know, like, there was some, th th there were some people in Vrindavan who was waiting for me, who were waiting for me, actually. Like, they heard about my story and they heard about that guy who was trying to walk to Vrindavan. Mm -hmm. Word oh. spreads, you know, like, okay. my friend Udav in France talked to some friends, that talked okay, to some okay, friends, okay. you know. The very fact that I arrived in Vrindavan saying that I didn't do it, it was great, actually. On the spot, it was a bit difficult for my ego, but actually it was great. It was the best thing that could happen to me. Because I would say, if we're talking in religious terms, I would say, like, God kind of took this away. F even this, he took it away from me, saying, like, even this you can't control. You think mm. you're strong. You think you can mm. you can do it. You think you can reach India. No, no, you can't even do that, you know. And it's, honestly speaking, looking back with, with the hindsight, it's... it's the best thing that happened in my pilgrimage is probably this. <laughs> because, you know, you can't... You know, so many people were like, oh, you should write a book about this and blah, blah, blah. You don't write a book about you not achieving your goal. Uh, you, maybe you can, but you don't do it in this spirit. You don't... You can't, you know... Like, you're not going to give a title to your book, which is, I didn't walk to India. You see my point? You can't, you can't write a book about, I didn't do it. <laughs> I, <laughs> you have I, to I, write some... I failed walking to India. Yeah, I failed walk. Maybe you can do it if you have some spiritual yeah. intentions. But my, you see my point, right? So Vrindavan, again, what I call my honeymoon with, with, with the Gaudiya happened because of this, I think. Otherwise, you it's, know... It's, it, you, you, you kind of felt humbled or kind of... or I mean, how was your feeling? Well, humbled like, is a tricky word because then you assume yourself to be humble. <laughs> I don't know, but... Um, but you were my like ego got a bit upset, defeated. Kind of like, yeah, like I was upset. very upset. I was very upset about myself. I was like, "You didn't do it. You're such a loser. You know, you couldn't do it. You didn't find a way to do it." Did you? Did you maybe thought like, "Okay, I could. You know, I can try it again. I can. You know, go yeah. other way. I can. Yeah. You know, 
I mean, because there's also other side you could yeah, go yeah. from, 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 you know. But then, yeah, yeah, definitely. I thought about this. But then so many things piled up. Like, I realized that it was also my last chance to stay with my wife because she wouldn't, she wouldn't accept more than this. I think if I would go back and do it again for two years or something. <coughs> so that was a big thing. <laughs> And uh, yeah, also after a few weeks in Vrindavan, I realized that I was there. It was like that. That's what I was looking for, you know. Plus, if you take what happened to me in the desert, I think the two things together. I was like, that would be pure ego if I just go back to Iran and try to walk from where I stopped and try to do this. That would be something for a national geographic, you know, not yeah. for a spiritual journey. That would be yeah. something you want to tell the story, you know. So um, yeah, in terms of unexpected turns that the journey took definitely this was a big one F being sick also my health was absolutely perfect from italy to armenia and you know i was sometimes living in really harsh conditions eating almost nothing sometimes eating from the trash you know i, I didn't have a single problem not even a flu you know i was living like in this cold house minus eight uh, not even the flu. Like my my level of joy was so high <laughs> that I just couldn't fall sick. And interestingly, as soon as I stopped to take a break, this is where I'm, you know I got sick basically. So that was very unexpected as well, and yeah, probably hopefully humbling as well. Once you fell sick and you had to go back to your countries, I I guess it kind of kills the mood or you feel less accomplished or whatever and then uh, you uh, from Iran you had to go back like you you didn't reach Rindavan on foot what you set out to do so you did feel like a loser in some way yeah yeah oh you can't even imagine I mean my whole at one point I thought my whole life was useless because I, I couldn't complete my vows mm. I mean you know you have to imagine like 16 months on the road right completely obsessed with this like the, I, I had no other life like you know you know i gave everything i had i had no friends i didn't consider anyone you know anymore so it gets so deep in your mind and in your heart like if you don't fulfill your values you you, you disappear it, it, like, it, so basically your journey took on a new identity identity of its own you were now identifying as this person completely or, completely right. yeah so yeah, it was really strong when you realize you, you're not going to do it, you know, you have to. But at the same time, what happened to me in the desert, I, I quickly said, but like that was the peak of my pilgrimage, what happened to me in terms of kind of uh, mystical experience. This in itself was enough for me to, to carry the burden of not being able to, to fulfill my vows, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would say it was very soothing. <laughs> Because I knew I had found something anyway, you know. Mm. So there was this two sides of myself. One side was probably the ego side, which was really disappointing of myself. And, you know, it's also very strong when you... People feed you. It's... People, you know, you, you don't have anything to give. The only thing you can give is the promise that you will do it. People respect you for that. So you build that respect. You know, the only value you have is that you're going to do it. So if you don't do it, you feel like a liar. You know, you feel like you've been taking advantage of people right. so much, you know. So I really had to deal with all of this, you know, psychologically. But the other side was so filled with the, the experience in the desert that happened that, you know, till that day, I'm still, I'm still filled with, this, with that experience. You know, whatever happens to my ego, you know, happens to my ego. But I have that, again, a backup, kind of, you know. Um, but yeah, that was, in one sense, you could say the real pilgrimage was the, the failure. <laughs> you know, like not being able to do it, for sure. And the worst thing that could happen to me, I really think now, I think it's, it could, that I, uh, it would have for me to do it, like complete it mm. perf perfectly, you know. Because again, can you imagine, like you arrive in Vrindavan and you're the guy who did it. Right. You know, it's the worst mood you can have. So... It also prevents me from from speaking about it too much, you know. Let's say like my self-esteem goes down at one point of my life, I'm going to try to catch up by speaking about my pilgrimage. Right. I, don't, I don't do this because I'm a loser, you know. And it's because I'm a loser that Krishna could touch my heart somehow, you know. So like whenever I hear someone say, oh, you know, that guy walked to India, I always go and I say, I, di I never reached India. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's so important, you know, because I didn't do it, you know. And that's probably why... I got some a little bit of spiritual benefit from it is because I couldn't do it.
so yeah i guess it answers the question like that's yes. my perception now I mean, ultimately, Christian knows the best. What's you know, what to yeah. give, what to give some someone, what to take, yeah. take from someone, uh, because you know many have different experience. We know, like you know, our own Gurma. She was he was going on the bus. He took the magic bus actually to India. Oh yeah. You know, and he has his own whole story, and he told it many times to us. What he, you know, what kind of, and his, you know, we know the story of Radhana's family. So, and if I may add, I mean, you know, the, the, it's pretty amazing to think that. Like you have a deal with someone, you have to fulfill your part, otherwise you don't get you don't get what you're looking for. Okay, what happened is that way before you have fulfilled your part, you've been given more than what you were expected. It gives you an idea of who God is, right? It's also the big lesson. You know, you 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 you, you never you don't even reach fifty percent of what you said you will do, and you you're being given two hundred percent of what you were expecting. So it's. It's a good starting point. It's like that's how it works between us and God. Like whatever you do, in one sense, it doesn't matter. You know, you're gonna get more than what you expected. So, I guess that was a very valuable lesson as well. You know, otherwise you think you deserve. Okay, like you know, I deserved love of God because I walked to India. Can you imagine how crazy you can become with this kind of statements? You know, <laughs> yeah. I would like to dig a little bit deeper because you mentioned it a lot of times that you took several vows about the importance for you of taking vows, about the meaning of vows. Yeah. Why why is it such a strong, or was it already, already when you was like mm -hmm. just knowing a little bit about the Vaishnava culture, why was it already such a strong thing? I'm still trying vows. to understand, you know, to understand <laughs> myself. I, I think, you know, maybe in 30 years when I'll, I will have more maturity, I, I want to write a book about this. Like, I want to call it Make Vows. <laughs> like, you know, like a message to a message to the people that will be my age that I'm now, you know, like when I'll be 50 or 60. I really want to make something like this because I think it's... Uh, it's. I think a book would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. It should definitely <laughs> Like, just like Make Vows, you know, like Vows is just such a... Um, it's so powerful. It's incredibly powerful. But you, what you, what you, what you what what you take out of it, or what? Well, I can't, it's difficult to summarize it, but um, I I don't really know how it happens mechanically. But you kind of you kind of like it's it's at the, you give up at the same time, so you don't rely on your own strength anymore at all. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you have to be strong to keep your vows, but it's not really the strength you think. It's more like your work is so little suddenly and something else is doing all the work. Because look, if, if, if you say like, my only duty now is to walk, not accept money, not lie, and that's pretty much all. All the rest you give up. You don't have to think about God. You don't have to pray. You don't have to judge your own thoughts like thought process you don't have to judge yourself about anything else as long as you keep those vows the deal is i know it sounds very very weird but basically the deal is is like i stick to my vows you do the rest you know and the amazing thing is that it does happen <laughs> it happens you know because and i don't know how it happens i can't explain that maybe maybe in a few decades i will understand but it 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 really works you know when you really so vows, it's kind of a way to gather all your energy and just focus it on something that you can actually control. Because we lose so much energy trying to control so many things that we can't control. But walking, uh, not accepting money and not lying, I mean, as much as you can, you, you can control. Well, experiences of being sick and everything proved me that I can't, even this I can't control. I can't control anything. But, you know, it kind of focuses your energy and the rest... Mm -hmm. you, amazing things will happen around you and in you because you don't waste your energy anymore trying to be for example you're unknown no one knows you and it's amazing you don't have to justify yourself for anything no one really cares about you as i said it's about it's all about projections hmm. no one cares about you you know they 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 hug you like anything they cry in your arms but the next if one week later they hear that you died life goes on you know and it's amazing because you don't get the attachment from people. You don't get, and, and no one knows your life and you don't have to say it. So no one knew my life and it was so comfortable. You can be whoever you want in one sense, you know, in silence. 
And so vows gives you this amazing freedom because the, your only duty is this. You focus your energy, you know. And I think, and that's a pure theory, but that's my theory, is that when you have all the rest of your energy available, God will take this energy and do something with it in one sense. You make yourself available for so, so much more. You know, because I think all of us, we complain that we don't have the energy all the time to do this and that. But it's not like we don't have the energy. It's, it's, the, the truth is that we spend our energy somewhere else. You know, and sometimes even in very, um, uh, how to say, let's say even if I have kids, I spend my energy for my kids. And it's, that's what I should do. It's my duty. But I can't complain that I don't have energy anymore to change 64 rounds per day. I have kids. I've chosen to have kids. My energy goes there. It's not like I don't have the energy. I have the energy, but I spend it somewhere. Vows will just, uh, how do you say in English? Like fix fixed, um, the leakage. It's like you have your energy leaking everywhere and mm -hmm. you just... You close the holes, right? And your energy goes inside and then it can be used for something else. For me, that's the power of vows. You know? But there's, there's, there's so much to say about vows in general. But mm -hmm. for me, it, it turned out to be incredibly powerful and I realized that it was the only way out for me is to make more and more vows. So I've made more vows after my pilgrimage, you know. When I got initiated, when I got married, you know, vows for me is, is like, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking some, because... because yeah. It's something secret. Vows is something secret. Actually. Yeah, and I don't trust myself. I trust the vows suddenly. When you do vows, you don't trust yourself anymore. You know you can't do it. But if you make the vow, then something else will come and it will happen in a sacred space. You know, and that's really the way I felt my pilgrimage. Like Alone, I, there's nothing I could do. But the vows in itself kind of calls a higher energy in it. And it it's, a, it's a sacrifice. Huh? Like. Yeah, but... In, 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 a, in a kind of sense, you give something up. There's a little bit of austerity, but not yeah. that much, you know, because the energy that comes to you when you do it, it's just so joyful, you know. There's, it's not very austere, honestly. <laughs> I, like, my life is much more austere now, hmm. honestly speaking. Now that I have a house and, and that work and everything, you know, comfort and everything, it's more austere. And I'm super happy, but still, in terms of austerity, I have more austerity now that, you know, when you walk, you see green grass and you can lay down, like... <laughs> you know, like no one asks you anything and and you have all your time to focus on your inner, I don't know, it's, it's such a such a freedom, you know. Was there, did, how did this happen? Did you write them down? Did you speak it out aloud in front of some deity or did you speak to yourself in a mirror or, or it was just fully internal? Mentally you decided, okay, this, 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 finish. No, you know what? They weren't really even clear for the first few days. Mm. I had ideas, but... There's there's one there's one image that is still present in my mind almost every morning. Almost every morning I have this image in my mind when I wake up and it's my last joint. And I threw it like this and it turned in the air and when it touched the ground, it was like a movie, you know, in my mind. It touched the ground and I knew something else started, you know. Mm -hmm. So this vow became really clear at that moment. Like I said never again. Not because I demonized marijuana or anything, but more because it was part of like the former life and I knew I couldn't deal with this later. So I just, you know, that was done. But for example, the so the only walking thing, yes, for sure, except for the sea, when I had to change my plans and, you know, I'm not going to swim. Uh, and the no money part, I didn't really know if I would accept what people would give me as money. But then the first time someone handed me cash through the, the I remember the window of a car, And just seeing the money, I couldn't even touch it. Mm. I don't know it, it why. It didn't feel right. I was I like, can... no way I can yeah. accept that, you know. So then it became part of my... And the no lying thing was from the beginning. Uh, of course, I didn't. I couldn't respect it because you always lie to yourself in, in so many ways. But And um, <coughs> yeah, alcohol. I had like... I have like a long love story with alcohol. <laughs> And um, French, after all. Yeah, <laughs> but like a, a little bit of a, you know, like excessive love story, I would say. And um, I told my wife when we started together in Italy, I said, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to drink at all. Like even if someone offers me like even this much, I'm, I'm just done with alcohol. And then the very first evening, we're welcomed by someone at her place, like a, a French teacher in Italy. It was fun. And she says, who wants a beer? And she just 
put it on the table and I just take it and drink it, like, you know, in one go. And my wife was <laughs> looking at me, was like, "What about your vow?" You know, That's a good start. And I finished it. I was like, "Oh my god!" You know, and I just realized that <laughs> it was so much embedded in my behavior. You know, that I really had to pay attention to it. And from that beer to this very moment I'm talking to you, I never touched a drop of alcohol anymore. But, you know, the vows got, like, more and more accurate as I, as I was walking for the first few weeks, I would say. Um, but, yeah, once they were set in stone, I wrote it on my net, on my, my notebook, and they became... The whole, the whole core of my pilgrimage was this, basically. You know, I wasn't even talking about God or thinking about God anymore. I was just like, I want to be empty and mm. stick to my vows, done, you know, because... You know, I was tricked by my brain mostly right. before that. You know, tricked by your, your own projections about God and all that. So I just wanted to be empty. So the vows really helped for that. And yeah, once they were decided strongly, there was um, no exceptions except, right. of course, the exceptions that were imposed on me, like being, you know. Okay, so maybe you let's 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 maybe enter Vrindavan. <coughs> let's what? Sorry. Let's enter Vrindavan. How was the, you, you went with your wife to Delhi and then you went to Vrindavan, this was, you went together? Or? Yeah, we went to Vrindavan and then um, I got caught immediately, like, you know, into the kirtans and temples and, and all that. I had some preconceived ideas about Iskand though, so it took me some, actually some weeks to accept to step in Iskand temple and mm -hmm. like kind of accept to change my ideas, which worked by the way, otherwise I'd be here. <laughs> And um, and then we walked the Govardhan, and that's where I met my current Gurudev, you know, in Govardhan. And then we followed my Gurudev and his god brother. We followed them to Punjab and uh, different places, and then we ended up in Jagannath Puri for a retreat. Okay, okay. So just just so how long actually took did it take for you to when you started in Italy? Until you arrive to... I think it's a bit more than uh, 16 months. 16 months, okay. Yeah. So, which means 11 months every day walking. And then f uh, more or less five months in total, staying, like just in different being places. sick or, or trying to find a place to stay for the winter. Okay. Yeah. How long did you stay then in, 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 in India? Or you never left India? I never really <laughs> left, yeah. <laughs> you never really left? No, because like my son was born a few months later. Literally, you know. I okay. mean, not no, sorry, not was born. Uh, my, my 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 wife was pregnant a few months later. Okay. So in India. In India, okay. in Mayapur. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you said okay. You you traveled with your with your Gurmach a little bit in India. Yeah. And then when and in Puri, the and then I started missing farming so much because it was it's 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 really part of my uh, personal balance, I would say. And people told me that there was land in Mayapur and maybe you can try farming there. So we ended up in Mayapur and then the lockdown came. This was right. Uh, in the beginning. Okay. <coughs> so we had the full lockdown in Mayapur, which was blissful. And uh, yeah, we never... Well, left. for uh, for those who not, not know, we, we actually made some video with you already. Uh, we have like... Right, in the garden. Right? You know, we started this yeah. Goranga Garden project. We, still, we have two, three videos actually on our channel about this. This is where we got to know you. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you came to Mayapur because someone told you his maybe you can farm there for farming. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. you were looking for like a, a land to farm. Land to farm. That's yeah. okay. But you wanted to stay in India. Why you wanted to stay? Not or? really. Uh, you know, at this time, you know, even before my pilgrimage, I was kind of on the road. So my mindset was very different. Like you don't plan things the same way. You kind of open doors everywhere and you see what happens you know that's the way i was living mostly so you know like i want to farm someone tell me this land let's go there if it doesn't work in two weeks i can be somewhere else but then yeah somehow it worked it worked out for the first time in my life by the way i wanted to stay somewhere I mean, i've never wanted to stay anywhere mm. um, whatever country i've been like really i've, I've never really been um, how do you say i have this nomad mind right um, yeah, Mayapur, Mayapur was different. <laughs> In terms of? I can't say, honestly, I don't know. It's so many things at the same time, you know. 
I really we have don't a channel know. called I Love Mayapur and now someone is like <laughs> <laughs> traveling so it's, much. Like, you have to be here to feel it, right? Yes. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's Well, maybe also I've been influenced by the fact that, you know, my son would be born here. So, you know, when you reach a certain... It gives you reasons to settle down as well, you yeah. know, like... I think there's, there's both. I guess there's yeah. external reasons and, external and there's internal reasons, reasons. for sure. But then the place in itself, you yeah. know, like the place in itself. When I, during what I call, again, my honeymoon, like for almost a year, I would every... And I know it sounds completely ridiculous, but it doesn't matter. But I would every day have tears in my eyes when I look at the trees, you know. Yeah. For me, it was like something else you know and it's not even in terms of like the kind of landscapes that i like it's not really what i used to like but there was something in the air something in the light something in the wind something in everything that was completely different from anything i'd seen before you know and yeah this is especially mayapur or yeah, mayapur. Rindavan also no mayapur mayapur when no. you came here i wouldn't settle down anywhere else in india honestly i love india like i'm, I'm very comfortable in india But like Mayapur has something for sure. And when I say Mayapur, I don't even talk about the community. It's also amazing, but it's something else than that. It's something mm. beyond anything you can see with your eyes. Like there's there's, there's really something. The harm path. Yeah, I guess. That's, I mean, that's what, what... <laughs> yeah, everyone um, would probably describe it in different words. Different. But Some people say, give it a name and you kill it. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, the, the principle of pilgrimage is something in itself that is amazing, but it can be applied in many different ways, you know. And we all, we're all pilgrims here, you know, like with or without walking, with or without, you know, we all, we all have that, that approach of, you know, being pilgrims. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here, basically. Yeah, I mean, there could be different reasons why people choose to... <laughs> Maybe live in Mayapur even and, and stuff, but from yeah. sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in this room, I meant, yeah. as far as I understand, as uh, at least you know the way we even going going to spirituality, you know, the world pilgrimage in itself is so interesting, you know. My my I Gurudev mean, I've, asked I've, me to write something about it in yeah. in my book, and the, the the introduction is all about the world pilgrimage in all the languages that I used to to know, and it's it's such a journey, you know, because you can go in how people understand the very conception of pilgrimage, you know. Yeah. From Tirtha to pilgrimage in Latin and all that, and it's so many things to say about it. So it's not really about walking. You know, yeah. walking is just an amazing way to do it because you're it it pacifies your body, it gives you so much healthy energy and all that. And you have something you know. to do actually also. Yeah, it keeps you it keeps your body <laughs> busy for sure. Yeah. Of just trying to sit. And, and you and have that that like the idea of going somewhere internally is is put into practice mm. physically because you have that point on the map that you need to reach. And you see those signs, you know, like 7,000 kilometers. And you're like, oh, my God, you know, it's still pretty far. But then, as I always say, I'm still on the road right now. Like, nothing really changed internally. Hopefully, you know, nothing really changed. I'm still trying to walk somewhere. And I still I still see signs and I still have moments where I'm discouraged. And, you know, it's, it's the same principle, right? Yeah. Same. <laughs> yeah, wow, and pilgrimage is a deep thing in our tradition also right it is as well for sure scriptures we read yeah. all the time this person went to pilgrimage that person yeah. went. and I, i think also very important is that you kind of learn or um, how to say i mean like you, said, you had this spirit you know when you were long, young you know I, you know i want to find i want to look i want to go on a pilgrimage and I think it's very important to you know to learn how to think or how like to to focus on such things because in late in life you know okay we you know we start to work we have kids we have family you know we have a job you know mm -hmm. and we can very easily lose that you know or you That's know true. lose that and and I think it's it's always good even if you even if you're busy you know to, in some ways you always have to get out of this schedule and kind of remind yourself again okay. There's actually more in life I want to achieve, you know, even, even if it's just on a Sunday, okay, you know, I take my Sunday to focus again on the spirit of, okay, who am I, who is God, where is God, where can I find him, and to actually never lose this kind of spirit and these questions, and, uh, and I think... Yeah, you, it's such a luxury. This, if you have this deep experience when you're young, you know, it can carry you the whole life, I think. It's true, because it's such a luxury when you have a year and a half to do only this, you know, yeah. like... It's the opposite, like the distractions becomes the material things. Yeah. 
you know, like you have distractions coming from outside, but the core of your daily life is yeah. being focused on what there is to hear. I always call it like this, what there is to hear, you know, because again, if you give a name to it, you can kill it. It's, it's true, you know, sometimes because we expect so much from, from the divine, but we, we don't know what form it will take. So we don't want to kill it with words. So sometimes it's just about opening the space and, and something immediately enters, you know, if there is space for that. <laughs> and for me, that's the core principle of a pilgrimage, being available. Because we think we are, but we're not most of the time, you know. We're actually not available to hear anything about anything. To, to, to be receptive. Yeah. Mean, like to... Our mind are like stuffed, stuffed with so many mm -hmm. things, our heart as well, you know. So and this process of emptying everything. You know, so and, and mostly we actually, f we try to manage everything on our own. Yeah, I think this same. is our daily exactly. process. Okay, you wake up, okay, what should I do today? You know, yeah. what plans should I make to achieve this and this and this? So we are in this thinking of, okay, we are in control, actually. This and is the, the, I would say like the vows that we take generally in the Gaudiya tradition, in one sense, you can wake up at 11 a.m. In one sense, you can wake up at 11 a.m., Change your rounds, serve your deities with all your heart, do nothing else with your life, God will take the rest in control, literally, you know. There's not so many other vows. Uh, of course, ac across the branches, it takes different forms, you know. Yeah. But my point is, like, again, it's a pilgrimage because you focus your energy on a few things that you know you can do with the help of your Guru Vargas or whatever. But, I mean, this is possible, it's doable, and the rest is taken care of with someone else. So I totally agree. Like you don't wake up. At least we're not supposed anymore to wake up in the morning and try to be in control of everything. It actually goes against the subtle vows. You know, there's, there's. I think there's def different layers in those vows. So I, I fully agree. And the pilgrimage is about having a time in your life when you can do only this. You know, I think. And I've always seen it as. Um, do you know those those sport games where they run and they give a stick to it to one another and mm -hmm. you have to take over? It's really, really a race. Yeah. So the way people were feeding me in one sense, I've always seen it as a kind of a game like this. Like I've always told myself, don't settle in this role. You're not a, this kind of pilgrim forever, for sure. One day you have to be on the other side. You see my point? Like I've always felt like it would be so cheap And like so sort of like cheap romantic to think that I can be this guy with a big beard on the road forever. And like, you know, people will be like, oh, you're so free, you know, because you, you can't your ego can't survive that. Like your ego will get bigger and bigger and bigger. So I've always thought that I have to be on the other side of the fence at one point. And that's what I'm trying to do now. Having a family, if a pilgrim knocks my door, I really hope I'll be as amazing as people have been with me when I was trying to achieve that. Mm. So there's um. Pilgrimage is so subtle, like there's so many things to say about it. Yeah. It's such a strong principle. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we think, I think we read a lot in our scriptures also about this, <coughs> about this principle itself. You know, you know, I don't know, you start very young actually as a Guru Kul student, or you be with the Guru, you go with pilgrimages with your spiritual master, being a little bit away from the family. So this we have this yeah. kind of principles. And also, kind of this can help us also like way later in our lives, actually, when we have to, you know, ultimately we have to renounce many things in our lives because we don't have it anymore. You know, we don't have the energy, sure. the power, and, and, yeah. and the kids are out of the house and you don't you work anymore. So one thing we'll a yeah, little bit go back in this meditation again. Sure. I think it could be very helpful, which we cannot, you know, cannot talk much about this. <laughs> we need a older person. Something I realized, I think, on, on, on the road as well about this is that within a tradition, sometimes what we lack is a moment of your life when you can give up everything and as a symbol, including your tradition in which you were born. I know it sounds a bit controversial, but I actually think it's very important that at least internally you can give, it, you can give up everything, including what you, you think is so important to keep <laughs> for a certain time. Again, to to hear what there is to hear, because you know you don't know what there is to hear, and sometimes having a strong religious or spiritual education gives you the foundation. But some at one point you have to jump in the complete unknown, see what happens, and that and in my opinion, this is where you will have a personal meeting with God. Mm. In one sense, you know, in literature they say with your God. Of course, it's the same, but your God in the sense of like how God. Act in your life, and 
I tend to think that tradition helps tremendously, but there should be a moment in your life when you can completely be nothing, hmm. be no one. Isn't that what you know. Krishna says? In the Bhagavad Gita, let's give, yeah. Yeah. Let's give everything up. All, all these concepts you have, all this ism and, and, and things you think you are, just give everything up. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I But we shouldn't be so confident that we ourselves are not going back to those. I mean, how to say? Of course, the principle is here, but we can as well put Tilak, Shika, Doti, say I'm Gaudiya Vaishnavism and say I'm initiated by blah, 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 and put all these designations back on ourselves, right? which is good in many ways. Yeah. My point is like there yeah. should be a dedicated time in, in our life when we are no one, including not part of anything, not the son of anyone, not the disciple of anyone, because when you're completely naked, you can hear what there is to hear. I keep saying this, but you know, mm. uh, at least in my opinion, that's one of my little realization on the road. That's it's you know that's what I've I've realized. I mean, I, f I think like it's exact, I think your your thoughts are li it's confirmed in our scriptures that it's very clearly stated. That yeah, maybe I'm really bad with scriptures, so yeah, I, I don't I'm, yeah, probably don't have the you know information to back this up. But <laughs> no, now looking back and reflecting on your ho whole journey you you definitely had some concept or or image like you said like a you know blue boy with a flute did you what 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 happened to that blue boy with the flute did you find him i would say he found me to a certain extent you know i, I didn't find anything myself but i think i was found by something <laughs> and It's such a bold statement to say that Krishna found me, but no, I mean, yeah, I had some very, very deep uh, connection, I, I think. Um, in terms of like Vrindavan as an external place, I, was, I wasn't disappointed because I kind of know how it works, holy places, one temple every 10 meters and everyone is so sure to be in the truth and all these kind of dynamics, you know. I'm not a very religious person spontaneously, like I'm, I'm a bit, I always keep my distance with religions in general. One thing I can tell you is that uh, from Vrindavan, for uh, I mean, um, from Vrindavan onwards, and for the next uh, what year at least, me and my wife we would meet in the evening and be amazed by people, which wasn't the case before, and it's not the case anymore. In the sense that we're like everyone, we tend now to see, you know, defects in people and all that, for almost like a year. And Vrindavan was the the fuel for this. We found everyone amazing. Absolutely amazing. And even when someone was, for example, in a completely different mood than us, or even very annoying, we were amazed. There was always something to see, something to admire, something to appreciate. So we got caught by this dynamic. You know, my wife was very uncomfortable in India in the beginning. She was crying every, every evening. You know, she didn't like it. She didn't want to stay. But still, she had this... We would notice amazing things in people and places all the time. So Vrindavan triggered that kind of... Uh, Thing in us, like where everything was, there was always value everywhere, you know. Whatever people would say would be like, oh, you know, I understood this from what he says or what she said, and you know, it was constant kind of. And then, so I wasn't disappointed, but my first dynamic was more like I will keep my distance with the religion because my intention wasn't really to join anything, and I still don't consider that I joined everything actually, but. Um, It was very nice to be uh, to heal all those ideas that I had about ISKCON in general. That was very. That was. It's. It's always a bl blissful experience to see the other side of the mirror. Just to touch a little bit on this, you had this from before, like pe yeah. what people told you before. Yeah, and I've I've done my research and stuff, you know, and I. We French people have, have like very strong opinions about what we call cults, hmm. you know, and. It is the pure fact that the way ISKCON behaved in France was that of a cult, not a, a Gaudiya movement at all. So I had all reasons to think that ISKCON was a dangerous organization, right? And then when I, when I met the real people from ISKCON, like the, the people of ISKCON, not ISKCON as a, as a, as a kind of concept, right? Or institution. Um, yeah. Then, you know, well, people are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> And um, that was specifically in Jagannath Puri where I had my... I really realized that, okay, it's not that I don't mind association with this devotees, but I want association because okay. it's, the dynamics are really interesting and beautiful. So and Vrindavan was very tough for my wife and blissful for me, honestly. 
But I quickly realized that I didn't want to live there. It's just too noisy and too urban for me. But like I had conversations for hours and hours and hours, and it was very austere. It was winter. But this was 2019, I think, around. Like yeah. This, huh? And it was like our flat. There was nothing. It was so cold. You know, I don't know. We had very little money at the time, so it was everything was so austere. But I didn't care about anything. I was just talking to like <laughs> drinking words from everyone. You know, as much as I could process, I would take. You know. Um, yeah. I I guess in, in a way like after hearing everything, in a in a nutshell, I think you know you hear the phrase the leap of faith, and uh, you know faith is a very very the most important probably word in this leap of faith, and embarking on a pilgrimage is literally a leap of faith. Uh, that's what holds most people back. You know, a lack of belief, a lack of faith in themselves in the universe in god and there are so many insecurities there are so many doubts there are so many yeah like even like even you said that you you so i mean i guess the, what i wanted to sort of ask you is that you took this leap of faith and now do you after after all of this and after reflecting back on your journey do you find yourself transformed in a way that you would now say that you you have more faith now and less doubts no honestly honestly speaking no um i think doubt, doubting is so much embedded in my nature like it's so much part of my samskar and my personality but i deal with doubts very differently um i call it my backup like i have some backups that are very strong now like i can question pretty much everything i'm doing now in terms of my tradition like anything literally i could qu i can question it but i have some strong backups in the background that someone wishes the best for you and you're being guided you know because again i think i went from theory to kind of a very 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 even like you know we say somatic experience it means like body experience as well like a meeting a real meeting so your brain will tend to forget this your brain will even try to give it rational explanations mm -hmm. because that's that's the way what we call mahamaya works right mm -hmm. it's just a filter that will try to convert the past to make it look like you wish it would, it, it should look right but so i have more doubts now but in my understanding i have more doubts because i'm a little bit more open than I was before and those doubts are not putting me in danger so much I don't feel like I have less fear and more doubts mm. before I had maybe less doubts but much more fear mm. now fear I have some fears but like again what happened to me in the desert for me was like the the final answer about am I am I take taken care of by someone and the answer was yes you know and so there's there's literally someone taking care of you whatever whatever choices you make this love is unconditional which means no conditions at all so do your best but don't think that you have to deserve that love and this love is constantly coming you have the umbrella so you choose whether you remove the umbrella or not so the doubts are just doubts will ev will always exist you know some some mystic mystic monks in our tradition even say that doubts is part of the spiritual world because without doubts there's no drama and without drama there's no love you know so you can go all the way but i would i would say that those doubts don't like crack my very being like mm -hmm. they they used to do you know because i know that beyond all my choices and affiliations and beyond all this there is someone taking care of me in the sense that i'm yeah. being guided you know so this this is uh, this is literally faith this <laughs> because this is faith uh, i don't you, know i mean because uh, it's 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 like i don't think that faith exists uh where no doubt exists faith exists because doubt exists much probably yeah so some of my um someone that is very inspiring to me said that we always think that the opposite of doubts is faith sorry the opposite of faith is doubt but actually the opposite of faith is certainty 
and exactly, exactly you know, it's, it sounds again a bit controversial but I think it's very true <laughs> certainties that will it will freeze you like right. Right, you know you will you'll dead basically yes. when you're when you're sure of something so you know I guess we have to navigate <laughs> the doubts so my pilgrimage mostly taught me how to navigate the doubts right. but doubts are I have even more now for sure about literally everything but not anymore about the fact that there is something taking care of me you know, and that my strength is not what I should rely on at the end of the day, you know, for sure. Do you have sometimes the feeling like you miss, you miss it even, like this? Yeah, this is a big challenge for me. That sometimes you feel like, okay, this was actually... Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you this also, <laughs> like, now kind of, because I'm sure it... it it was so challenging and it was so difficult and it, it was so such an intense emotional psychological uh, experience uh, and it, it must have given you some sort of a high almost you know uh, you feel. Mm. and and now to to lead a more normal mundane <laughs> humdrum life what, yeah what, what what are your what are your thoughts and feelings i miss the desert <laughs> I really miss the desert. Like I'm in love with the desert. So for me, it's like sometimes it can be a bit of a struggle. Yeah, like remembering myself that you know I'm happy where I am, and um, even though it's not that difficult because I'm very happy. But you know, sometimes when you have you have difficulties, the desert for me is really something. But just to give a little bit of context, like how, how long you've been in like like in the desert? Like how many days? Like you were walking two months, yeah. but yeah. without. But you were like going from city to city. You knew where you're going, and yeah, like, there was like villages here and there. Yeah. So you you know the longest not I've done, I think, without villages was probably seven days. You know. Seven days without any village. Yeah. Just on your own in the desert. Yeah, but with I had um, a wooden chariot that I built in Georgia, so I could carry like up to 18 liters of water on it. So I was carrying my chariot, you know. And food. Food was tough. For for this week was really tough, but I had like some bread it was enough to like keep the body working, but it was a bit challenging. And the water is salty there, you know. So when you find a well, it's actually salty water, so you can't drink it. So water was like, you know, I ended up in some places where people would refuse to give me water because it was so precious for them. So yeah, this part of the desert was a little bit uh, challenging. Um, but I miss that so much. I mean, this emptiness, like it's just, just like amazing <laughs> so soothing and no sound coming out of your mouth for like 10 days sometimes you know that's for me that's amazing i know i sound very talkative but i'm because you because you didn't talk at all nothing yeah different I'm, I'm, I'm actually very happy in silence and I, I used to sing actually i'm saying this but i remember now that i used to sing this one mantra that i, that I heard in france and i used to sing it sometimes all day um so yes i miss it for sure uh, but it's an interesting question because I remember one of the few things that I wrote in my notebook is talking to my future self. Because I had that experience in Cambodia way before. I'm not going to talk about that, but like sort of a very, uh, how do you say this? You know, like like being in the jungle for like a year, you know, it was just a piece of cloth and like being in this whole kind of movie-like environment. So when you're back to the city or whatever, your native country, everything s seems so boring, right? Your life itself seems so boring. So I got trapped in that kind of illusion once before. So I'm on the road, I was talking to my future self and be like, remember how it's actually like, you're the same guy. You know, the, the challenges are the same, they just take different shapes, basically. So it helps me sometimes to read the notebook and remember how much I was the same guy, just in a different environment and the challenges are the same. And I'm the same pilgrim. I'm the same guy. I'm still walking towards something, you know. And honestly speaking, of course, yes, we have so-called a normal life, if normal means something. But we also live in Mayapur. We, like the spiritual food here is so available that, you know, if you want to have mystical experiences and stuff, you can have it, you know, in one sense. But yeah, I totally get what you mean. You know, I have kids, I have to work, I have to deal with a lot of, uh, for example, money has never been a thing for me before. So now I have to think about it. But somehow, yeah, I miss the desert, but I don't I don't at all have this illusion that, you know, 
or maybe I did the wrong choice, or my life is boring, or not at all, you know. And all along the road, I knew that this wasn't my destiny forever, you know. I really knew it. My wife sometimes says, like, if she wasn't there, I would be one of those... Uh, old guy in Varanasi mm. with a beer and just smoking pot, you know, that's probably how I would mm. end up. Because I have that nature also mm. that I can be completely like out of society and, and, you know, but I'm much happier like this, honestly speaking. And, you know, the, the real challenges, the good challenges for me are here, mm. doing what I'm doing. That's how I will grow up and lose me, hopefully a little bit of my ego and, and you know, That's that's what I need to do, and I'm very uh, peaceful with this, really. And again, as I said, the pilgrim has to go on the other side of the fence at one point. You can't be fed by the world forever. You have to be the one who feeds at one point. It means I want pilgrims to knock on my door, and I want to give them a bed, and I want to give them food, and I have to work for that. It's not like Krishna is going to give me bread for me to give to the pilgrim. That's not how it works, you know. So I, I kind of prepare myself for that during the pilgrimage, you know. But I, I do have uh, nostalgia, for sure. And uh, we have plans with my wife, you know. It's part of our, it's part of our marriage deal. Like, we're going to buy donkeys and, and, again, like, do a long, long trip with our kids. You know, wow. this kind of thing. So I'm not planning to give it up completely. You know, <laughs> we, have, we have plans. <laughs> Definitely. Awesome. I fully see you like this. <laughs> I can't fully imagine it. <laughs> yeah. you, you made him really, you made Vayner really like, really, I can feel it. His yeah, but I, the, I mean, I can, I can completely, you, you won't, you won't understand because you don't know so much about me as a person also, but it's like, I'm meeting like my kind of twin brother. You know, it's like, it's like that kind of a feeling for me. It's like, it's a, uh, yeah, just like a mirror image. <laughs> well i mean just, just thinking about it i mean you know yeah at one point go back to i mean now we have our kids you know they're like they're they're in a certain age they have to go to school the, you know this and that but i mean we did some stuff with our kids already but uh <coughs> yeah, but, but latest when they are like you know older i can imagine myself let's <laughs> But isn't it what, what is Vana Prasta actually is also yeah. about? Yeah. To give it again yeah. all up and then travel to different I was at a Harikata a few days ago about this. Exactly, yeah. It's exactly what it is. And the, uh, the, a few days ago in Puri, there's a Harikata about this, and the, the sannyasi said, um, well, nowadays you can't go to the forest anymore. I was like, no way, I'm going to the forest. <laughs> 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 like, why not? You know? <laughs> of course I'm going to the Vana, you know? <laughs> like... <laughs> But anyway, yeah, it's exactly what you said. Like the principle is, yeah, definitely, it's exactly this. You and it's it's an it's an a new death, you know. Like you you can die once when you're young doing your pilgrimage, but you have to die again, die to your house, die to your children, die to everything in order to die to your body at one point. I mean, definitely, it's part of the. I mean, again, like no one should said I've done a pilgrimage. You know, we can say I've started a pilgrimage, <laughs> you know, we're, we're never done. I've finished it. <laughs> we're never done. Some okay. last questions or something you'd like to share? Well, that was a lot. Like, <laughs> <laughs> something else you'd like to That, share. Uh, I, I just shared more than, than I shared in the past year, <laughs> like in terms of, yeah. yeah no, no, I'm very grateful for everything. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks for coming on. It's a nice conversation. It was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, it's... It always, for me, it feels like we could go on and on, actually. <laughs> yeah, There's yeah. much more questions. And <laughs> <laughs> it's... Uh, yeah. But uh, I think at one point we should, we should stop. And... Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for, for sharing everything, for sharing the story. And... Uh, yeah, I guess more to come. Yeah. We already spoke. Also, we would soon make a garden video again. Oh, that's great. <laughs> And uh, yeah, yeah, the garden needs uh, needs advertisement. <laughs> needs advertisement. <laughs> God needs some ads yeah. to inspire some people to join, huh? Well, to thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you for the conversation. It was very, very nice conversation. Yeah.